when it comes to the preservation of the Christian scriptures? How were they preserved over the centuries? So we're told in a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell that there actually are hundreds of thousands of textual differences between the documents of the New Testament. In this chap passage, look at what he says. Of the 150,000 variant readings, only 400 caused any doubt about the textual meaning. I smile when I read that. I mean, in the whole New Testament, there are only 400 places where the meaning of the passage is changed by the textual differences between manuscripts. And he says, of those, only 50 are of great significance. That's quite amazing. That in the Christian Bible, the way it was preserved was such poorly, poor quality control that they emerged with 50 places where the difference in the meaning of the text is of great significance. I'm going to give you an example in a moment. But let's think about the preservation of the Jewish Bible. We know that our Jewish scriptures, there were at least three reasons, at least three reasons why it would be much harder to preserve the Jewish Bible. Number one, the Jewish Bible is much older. The Jewish Bible is composed between 3,300 years ago and about 2,400 years ago. The Christian Bible is composed between about 1,900 years ago and 1,800 years ago. It's a much younger book, so you don't have to preserve it as long, number one. Number two, the Jewish Bible is much longer. The Christian Bible has approximately 7,000 plus verses. The Jewish Bible has three times that many verses. So our book is much longer. It would be harder to preserve. And number three, the whole world wasn't trying to kill the Christians every year. We did not have a moment of peace. We are a people that's had to preserve our scriptures in the face of ongoing attempts to annihilate us and persecute us. The Christian church for most of its history was in the driver's seat. No one was bothering them. And yet they walk away with a much easier text to preserve, and yet they have only 50 places where there's great significance in the discrepancy of the text. Whereas the Jewish Bible, infinitely more difficult to preserve, basically has a few dozen places where the spelling of a word is different, and the spelling does not affect the meaning of even a word. Let me give you one example of one of these textual problems in the Christian Bible. The earliest gospel, the earliest text of the gospels is the Gospel of Mark, written about the year 70. Matthew is written about the year 80, Luke about the year 90, John about the year 100. Mark is the earliest account, and you could suggest maybe the most accurate. Maybe the most accurate. And yet, the earliest manuscripts, the earliest manuscripts of the book of Mark are missing the last 12 verses that are found in Christian Bibles today. Many Christian Bibles will have those last 12 verses, but they'll have a footnote saying these verses don't appear in the earliest manuscripts. But these last 12 verses are very significant. They talk about the resurrection of Jesus. It's the foundation of Christianity. Paul says, if Jesus was not resurrected, your faith is in vain. And yet here we see that the difference in the text of the Christian Bible, where today's Christian Bibles have this story, the earliest versions don't have it, and scholars suggest that that omission was so embarrassing that later writers had to stick it in. They had to make sure it was there. Wow, this guy is incredible with the... Uh crazy way that he presents things. It's like he makes, makes this little clean little box for himself and a clean little box for Christians, a clean little box for Jews and then he starts saying they are this, we are this, they, us and them, we are this, they are this. And that's nowhere near how the world actually works. So let's start uh, analyzing what he said. First of all, he talks about uh, the reasons it's harder to uh, preserve the Jewish scriptures. 
First of all, he, t he talks about quality control. It's the quality, con they have much better quality control than the Christians do. Well, he gives absolutely no credit to God at all for the preservation of the scriptures. And he says how old they are. We've been preserving them for 3,000 years. Um, well, the oldest Jewish manuscript known to man is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And uh, what they had preserved the, is from the Tiber, Tiberian Codex, which is about 700 AD. So, and then the, the next oldest one would be the Leningrad Codex, which is about 1000 AD. So, these scriptures um, were actually, like there was a time when only a small group of rabbis actually uh, had these um, manuscripts. And they, they might not have even had the complete thing. But these codexes appeared out of history, and 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 they they are they are what the preservation is. There there was not like thousands of copies, and that Jews all over the world had all these manuscripts. They didn't. There's two. There's there's the the Leningrad Codex and the Tiberian Codex. These are the two that are stand in authority as the Masoretic Jewish scriptures until the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered and then they found uh, particularly the great Isaiah scroll which was uh, one of the rare complete ones and um, yeah amazingly the the um, the newer codexes are, are uh, almost exactly the same so there uh, was a good preservation, but from before the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is 100 BC, from before that, we have no idea. First of all, we have the Septuagint, Greek manuscript, which is a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, which was made about 300 BC. And that is, uh, it's almost the same, like it has the complete Jewish Bible in it, but it also has a lot of other things added into it, and it has quite a few differences. So we haven't found any Hebrew manuscripts from before 300, uh, not, none complete. You know, we found there's fragments, but nothing complete. So we're just going on the basis that uh, what the uh, Tiberian manuscript is, and what the uh, and with along with the Dead Sea Scroll, um, that it is pretty much been well preserved. That this certain group, this certain um, core group of Jewish scholars have kept this certain group of manuscripts um, preserved. Now there are other manuscripts um, that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that in the Qumran caves and they contain uh, um, different books that talk about different things and if you look at the teachings of Jesus and the apostles, they are teaching, uh, like when Paul says, all scripture is given to, for the benefit of Christians, um, that it's the Hebrew manuscripts from the rabbis, those as well as some others, like the other ones from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and others that are no longer available to us. So there was apparently a lot of manuscripts around and at that time, and there were uh, many different Jewish groups at that time. 
but the actual group that was running the temple had what we would call the Tanakh, most likely. Uh, but it's really um, not uh, written in stone yet about uh, who had what exactly. So he's going by the idea that the Jews preserved the Tanakh. And uh, actually, in truth, God preserved the Tanakh. And God also preserved the Christian manuscripts as far as what we have. And there are differences between those two things. Now, the Christian manuscripts is a different story, as Christianity is a different story than Judaism. Okay? Now, if we remember back in, uh, um, I can't remember the scripture exactly, but the idea when God sent Babylon to, t to carry away the Jews, he had sent Assyria to carry away the northern kingdom, and he sent Babylon to carry away the southern kingdom. And the, the whole idea was, as God put it, that I will bring the kingdom of Judah back, not for their sake, but for the sake of David. So it not, has nothing to do with them being so good. It's because I want to fulfill my promises that I made to David, and I also want to fulfill the prophecies that have been made. That is why they were brought back. It's not because they're so great. And that is why the scriptures have been preserved, to fulfill the prophecies made to David. It has nothing to do with the Jews being so great. They are the beneficiaries of God doing these things. Okay? Now, the Christian scriptures, when uh, Jesus and the apostles were on the earth, um, now their, their doctrine was um, basically uh, pro-Moses, but against the Talmud, which is the, uh, the Talmud is like the rabbi's commentary on the Tanakh. Uh, because they had many traditions that uh, Jesus did not agree with, uh, their interpretations of the tel of the Tanakh. So that was basically where they stood. And um, what was I getting to? So uh, now the Christian scriptures. As I explained before, it's not really about uh, reading every word of the Christian scriptures and following it. It's about reading the Christian scriptures and understanding from the Christian scriptures that it opens up a whole new understanding of the Tanakh, which you can read also. And it's all considered the Word of God. The Tanakh being the foundation and the, the set-in-stone foundation. The Christian scriptures being a teaching of the Tanakh to shine light on what it's actually talking about. The prophecies that have been fulfilled and the ones not yet fulfilled. And then the Christian scriptures, they were not just like written down like God would tell a prophet to write down. Some of it was. Like the book of Revelation was a vision given by God to John to write it down. That was much like the uh, prophets in the Tanakh were. But the rest of it was much of uh, written down by people who... Uh, mainly historians that um, wanted to keep a make because Christianity was starting to grow they wanted a record what did Jesus say what did he actually say so all the people that knew him and people that heard of him 
were all giving their testimonies and these historians were gathering this information and writing it down. And there were certain parts like uh, they say in, in the Gospel of John the, the story of the, um, the adulterous woman that was brought before Jesus and uh, where he said what let he who is without sin cast the first stone that that story was added later on after the gospel had already been written because it was uh, a legendary story that sounded a lot like Jesus that probably was Jesus that they said that we cannot let this fall away into history we'll add it into the gospel so uh, the Christian Gospels were put together very much like that and um, now what happened was the Christians were very much persecuted they were first persecuted by the Jews because the Christians were Jews working within the synagogues and the, the Jewish leadership push them out of the synagogues for teaching about Jesus and uh, so they were persecuted that way and a lot of times with death and um, then uh, the Christians were persecuted by the Romans for not uh, sacrificing to the Roman gods um, the Jews were already exempted from the sacrificing to the Roman gods at that time. They didn't have to, but the Christians were not exempt. Um, now, after about uh, 325 AD, when the Roman Emperor Constantine declared himself as a Christian, he, um, he didn't... Um, he didn't like end Roman paganism and force all Romans to be Christians. He added Christianity, he added Jesus to their pantheon of gods. So he said, okay, we have this, uh, um, what do they call it? The uh, pontificate, right? The, the Roman emperor was the chief pontiff the Most High Pontiff, Maximus, Pontifex Maximus. So he's the head pontiff, and they had this college of pontiffs where each pontiff was a pontiff of a certain Roman god. And the emperor was the Maxim, Maximus Pontiff, who was the head of all of those. And they all had their duties to keep this, each one to keep certain gods happy and the Roman Emperor was in charge of it all and that way Rome kept all the gods of all the different kingdoms happy so they would absorb religions when they conquered a nation they would absorb it and they absorbed Jesus and they put Jesus in the College of Pontiffs as one of the gods okay and uh, they probably even had one for the Jewish God uh, they had one for every god that they conquered. That's how all the Egyptian gods are part of Romanism. The Greek gods are part of Romanism. They, they just absorbed all these religions and just acknowledged all of the gods that they found as they conquered lands. So, um, when that happened, the, the, the Christianity became very popular. And, and all of the elite in Rome started to become Christians for political reasons. And also, a lot of authors wanted to be in, uh, wanted to be like an apostle. And so they were writing all these gospels and all these um, strange uh, texts about uh, claiming to be apostles. And uh, part of the uh, thing of building the Christian canon was to sort out what was really from the apostles 
and sort it away from what was all this crap that was being produced in the in the third century. That's basically when it started. Uh, we do have some good um, uh, writings from real Christians that lived between those eras, like in the second century, like Justin Martyr, for example. He's a good uh, a source of seeing what Christians were actually like during the second century. So the Christian Bible, uh, it had a little bit different path of how it came to be. Now, the Roman church, when uh, the Roman emperor moved, Constantine moved his capital to Constantinople and left Rome vacant, the Roman bishop kind of took that position and became more powerful. And they, they, they were like the seat of the Roman church, Christian church. And um, they uh, translated the Bible, the Christian Bible, into Latin, or I think the whole Bible. They translated it into Latin. That became known as the Latin Vulgate. And uh, they were very much based on tradition. They carried uh, their traditions, and they also had a lot of Roman culture in, Christ in their Christianity. And um, over the centuries, there were other Christian groups, but they were all annihilated by the Roman Christians. There was uh, Abergesines and uh, I think another one called uh, Hussites. And they were, uh, they're, they're recorded by the Roman Christians as heretics. But when we read about uh, the charges against them, the charges against them are basically for believing the Gospels. Uh, they were uh, completely annihilated and all of Europe was conquered in the name of Christ uh, by a king named Charlemagne um, on behalf of the Pope. So it was this uh, Popish Christianity that basically conquered Europe. And then after that, uh, a lot of uh, particularly Roman Catholic priests who were learning the, the, the scriptures, they started to uh, raise questions. Why do we do this? Why do we do that? When, why do we not do these other things that were taught by the apostles? Um, and also, as I explained before, when, when Constantinople fell to the Muslims, a lot of the Greek Orthodox Christians fled into Europe and brought their Greek manuscripts with them. And there was some differences found between the Greek and the Latin manuscripts because the Latins had, you know, their traditions had worked their way into the translations. So particularly two things that, that were a contention was uh, the Latin um, Bible, what said penance, while the Greeks uh, scriptures were saying repentance. So there was a contention over is it repentance or penance? And uh, the other one was over the deity of Mary, like uh, whether she was the mother of God or just a human being. So uh, those were the two biggest contentions to begin with. And later on came others, like the Eucharist being the actual body and blood of Christ, transformed by the Mass into the, like a ritual. It's an Egyptian ritual, really, if you look at it. Um, so a lot of these things were happening within Christianity. And so it's not just about whether you're a Christian or not, it's also about what kind of Christian are you? Are you a, uh, a traditional Orthodox Christian? Like with the papacy and the Greek Orthodox, uh, that they go claim this 
line all the way back to the apostles? Or are you a Protestant type of Christian where I would rather just read the Gospels myself and decide for myself what I should be doing or not doing? Um, so uh, the rabbi here, he, he tends to uh, say Christians. And all the charges he makes are basically against the more orthodox Christians. Now what happened with the manuscripts also is that um, eventually uh, the, when the Reformation happened and the Protestant Christians became a power of, of themselves, a political power, the counter-reformation was formed by the Roman Church. And this was uh, efforts to bring the Protestants back into their church and to get rid of these ideas. So the Protestants, their effort was to restore the Christian scriptures from the original. Let's, let's get back to the original as much as we possibly can and restore it. And out of all those efforts came the uh, Geneva Bible and the King James Bible. Those were the two big ones at the time in the uh, early 19th century. So they had these two Bibles. This is, we finally have the Word of God in English so that we can actually start studying it and learn it. And, and the, the average person can have a copy and read it themselves. This was the, the, the main goal of the Protestants. So what happened was when the Roman Church found that uh, was happening, all of a sudden they discovered two more manuscripts. Okay? And these are now considered the oldest Christian manuscripts. But what they are is they're from the third century. They're third century manuscripts. And there are, uh, the, like the one, the one text, I think it's called the Nestle text, or, or the Sinaiticus, is, it was in the garbage. It's um, the most corrected manuscript ever found. <laughs> it's like got hundreds and thousands of corrections in it. It's like a student writes it out, like a, back then books were copied by hand. They didn't have printers. So the student would write it out and the teacher would correct it and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Well, that manuscript is like the student's first try at writing a manuscript. He's like, there's so many mistakes, it's incredible. And what they did was they, they took any mistakes, they had to decide, well, what's the real one and what's the mistake? Or what, what is the correction? So what, what they did, the Roman church, was every decision to be made, they made on their own behalf. And then the Protestants, every decision they made, they, they said, well, that's not the way it goes. So there's always this division in Christianity between, are we going to go with the traditional Roman way or are we going to go with what we think is the right way you know what it really was is more what protestants are into right so there's all this division so this is how we get these 50 different contentions and and it's mostly about verses that were added so uh, a protestant would say well, those verses were removed in the 3rd century manuscripts where uh, the, the Catholics would say, no, those verses were added after the 3rd century. So this is the contention. Um, now the Protestants are going by the, um, the Greek Orthodox manuscripts that had been never fallen away. Like they had been copied and their tradition goes back to the Church of Antioch which is uh, like in the book of Acts. So 
they had been copied in Greek since then. They had never been copied into another language and they had never been subjected to the Roman um, emperor and his changes and his traditions. This is why Roman Catholics have idols. Like Protestants call them idols, but they say they're not idols. Well, you know, the, the, the apostles uh, spoke very much against idols, uh, calling them actually demonic. So there are some big differences between Protestants and Catholics. So um, the rabbi talks about Christians as if there's one Christian church. There's, there's many, many, many different Christian uh, churches or different followings, depending on how they view all these different aspects of the teachings. Uh, there's a lot of uh, different opinions. Same with Jews. There's uh, not as much as Christians, but there's, you know, you, I could probably count ten different types of Jews when they have different ideas. Uh, some are more orthodox, some are more liberal. Uh, it's the same thing with Christians. So when you start talking like this rabbi, like there's one Christian and one Jew, He's right and he's wrong. It just doesn't work that way. Now, with the Christian manuscripts, uh, myself personally, I more lean towards the Texas Receptus. Now, I know that is a collection of the Greek. The Greek manuscripts had a few variations as well. And it's kind of like a, a, a man collected them together to try to say, okay, let's just gather everything that was said and put it in one one book. And uh, you can just sort of sort that out and figure out uh, what what the message is in general. It's more about that. And it's the Christianity is more about receiving the Holy Spirit of God and learning how to depend on the Spirit to lead you into all truth. And all truth does not reside only in the scriptures. It resides in the world around you. And it resides in your life and how uh, you apply that to your life. And the scriptures are very much an important part of that. But it's not the end-all, be-all of, um, you know, it's, it's not sufficient without the Holy Spirit, okay? So, you know, the rabbi seems to be talking. For some reason, uh, I got cut off there. But I think that's sufficient to make the point. And uh, I'll see you next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And thank you for supporting my channel.